as determinism. Okay, so that's libertarian uh, incompatibilism. Hard incompatibilism, again, uh, agrees that if there is, uh, if determinism is true, then there's no free will, but adds that determinism is true and concludes there must not be any free will. Typically hard incompatibilists, we didn't discuss the main motivations for it, but typically their motivations overlap significantly with some of the arguments we've already discussed. Hard incompatibilists tend to buy the untouchability argument for incompatibilism. Um, but they also tend to think that those libertarian accounts of free will, like I just mentioned, are not any good, either on empirical grounds um, or on the grounds that uh, they ultimately make free choice a matter of randomness, which is not real freedom. Um, and when you combine those two, if you're skeptical about the possibility of any coherent, sensical, libertarian account of, of freedom, and you think that freedom and determinism are incompatible, then your position is, if determinism is true, we have no freedom. If determinism is false, we have no freedom. So either way, we have no freedom. That's often what gets people, such as Parabu, to hard and compatible. The main challenge for hard and compatibilism is a practical challenge, is one way to think about it. Opponents of hard and compatibilism ask, what are the personal and social consequences if I accepted hard incompatibilism, much less if we all accepted hard incompatibilism. We all rejected free will and with it moral responsibility because remember we're presupposing that free will is required for any of us to be responsible for what we do. So the rejection of free will amounts to a denial that anyone is ever responsible. What, what does that mean practically? Are there bad consequences to believing that? Um, as we discussed in the ethics of belief section, there's some philosophers think that if a belief has bad consequences, that can be a reason not to hold it, um, whether or not it's true. And so the upshot is this is a kind of uh, um, pragmatic objection to hard incompatibilism. If the consequences of that belief are bad enough for ourselves and for society, then perhaps that gives us reason to withhold belief in hard incompatibilism altogether even if it's actually true. Okay, so um, in the piece, uh, Why We Have No Free Will, Paraboom is defending hard incompatibilism from a series of these practical objections. Each objection has the same kind of form. It claims that um, if we believed hard incompatibilism, some bad consequence or consequences X would follow. In each case, the alleged bad consequence is slightly different. Um, but in each case, Paraboom then tries to uh, rebut the objection by saying, actually, belief in hard incompatibilism either wouldn't or doesn't have to lead us to these bad consequences. Um, that's sort of the structure of the, the debate. So here is the, the objection in the form of an argument. Um, the bad consequences argument, BC, against hard incompatibilism. First premise, belief in hard incompatibilism has bad consequences. We're going to specify what those are in a second. Second premise, BC2, we should hold, uh, I should say not, we should not hold beliefs with bad consequences. Should not hold beliefs with bad consequences. This is, um, can get this certainly from some versions of Clifford and some versions of, of James. Um, therefore, we shouldn't believe hard incompatibilism. BC2 is certainly worthy of its own discussion, um, but it would take us a little too far afield, so we'll just sort of spot the opponent of uh, hard incompatibilism, that premise, and then ask why, uh, why do they think that belief in hard incompatibilism has bad consequences? Um, well, the defense of that claim goes as follows. Um, anyone who denies that there's free will and responsibility, so the thought is, um, is thereby rationally committed to holding some other beliefs that themselves are clearly dangerous, according to the defender of this um, objection. So first, um, the claim is that if hard incompatibilism is true, if we believe it, 
and if there's no free will, then there's really no right, right or wrong. The businesswoman, for example, doesn't do anything wrong by continuing on to her business meeting if she was determined to do it. It wasn't wrong of her to do. Criminal punishment is unjustifiable. Um, if no one is ever responsible for what they do in any meaningful objective sense because no one's free, then it is unjustifiable of us to uh, punish and certainly incarcerate somebody for doing something that they were fated and determined to do long before they were born. Uh, it's as if every criminal was literally coerced to do what they did. We don't hold people who are coerced into doing things accountable, so why should we hold anyone who breaks any laws or does anything that we socially agree is, is wrong accountable? And it would be wrong of us to do that, in fact, if there is such a thing as uh, morality for that matter. Um, and there's actually a, a third one that I'm not going to go into detail on because we didn't get to in class, but just this idea of sort of uh, despair, right? Um, that if um, if free will does not exist, it's hard to, according to the objection, make sense of the idea that we can be genuinely uh, responsible for our accomplishments. Um, and Paraboom has things to say about that. But I'm going to focus on the right and wrong and the punishment one. So let's say a little bit more about this first claim. Why? What's the th line of thought here? Um, well, here here's what they're thinking. Let's take the businesswoman again. If the businesswoman was determined to continue walking after she saw this um, assault going on and go to her business meeting and kind of pretend she didn't see anything. Um, if she was determined to do that, she was determined to do it 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 10,000 years ago. She was determined by factors over which she had absolutely no control. Given the way things were long before her birth, it was fixed and determined that she was gonna walk away from that scene and not intervene uh, long before she was around. Uh, so she's not responsible and she's not free. So how can it be in any, how in any way can we say it's wrong for her to walk by and let this assault continue rather than intervening? And more generally, if we're all determined to act as we act, then nothing we do can be wrong. Here's Paraboom's response, which I think is pretty plausible. He says, look, we need to slow down and distinguish between two things. Moral responsibility is one concept. Um, this is praiseworthy for right actions and blameworthiness for wrong actions. Um, so for example, uh, the cold-blooded murderer who pr does a premeditated uh, calculating um, planned out killing of someone that, that he hates, um, that person we think is barring, you know, circumstances discovered about, say, mental, uh, serious mental health issues or something, that person is far more a accountable or responsible for their wrongdoing than someone who, by sheer accident, hits uh, a pedestrian with their car. Um, that can happen through absolutely no fault of either party. Um, we still, though, recognize the badness of the person dying. And we might even describe what the person did with the car as, in some sense, wrong. But we wouldn't blame them for it. It's a blameless wrongdoing. No one was at fault for what happened, as tragic as it was. By contrast, the murderer uh, killing the person intentionally and in a premeditated way and out of hate and all of these factors lead us to say not only was that wrong, but that person is blameworthy for what they did. So Paraboom wants to say, look, we, we generally distinguish uh, right and wrong on the one hand from praiseworthiness and blameworthiness on the other. We forget about free will and whether it exists. In ordinary life, we distinguish these things. Now, Paraboom says, if hard incompatibilism is true, then there's no free will. And yes, that does mean that there's no responsibility. No one is ever 
accountable or responsible, praiseworthy or blameworthy for anything they do. But that's different from saying that nothing anyone ever does is, is right or wrong. So it still is the case that what the murderer did was wrong and bad, just as it was the case that what the uh, accidental uh, pedestrian hitter did was wrong and bad. It just turns out, if Paragoon's right, neither of them is responsible. Um, but that alone doesn't undermine anything about what's right and wrong. It could be that everything we think is right and wrong really is, but it what we're wrong about is just that anyone's ever accountable for their right doing or their wrong doing. So that's Paragoon's reply to that objection. Yes undermines responsibility, no does not undermine morality or right and wrong. Secondly, he uh, faces this other concern that I think is maybe even more common um, and harder to deal with, I think. If we are not responsible for what I do, for what we do, then no lawbreaker in any society is responsible for breaking the law. But the criminal justice system presupposes that criminals, when they suffer punishment in general, that they are to some degree culpable for their wrongdoing. This is precisely why it is that we have built into the law um, reduction of sentences or even um, throwing out of cases for people who are discovered in trial to not be culpable, to have done something unknowingly. Many crimes have built into them a knowledge component, intentional uh, in intentionality. The recent trial, uh, the Derek Chauvin trial, much of the debate centered around his internal state of mind. Um, this is a very common thing in these kinds of uh, both violent uh, violent crime trials and also like white collar criminal cases. You'll often see uh, CEOs and white collar criminals try to get off by saying, I didn't know what the law was, which usually isn't a good defense, but for some laws it is. And all of this just to say like, we recognize that lack of responsibility tends to mitigate or tends to um, undermine whatever interest the state and the justice system may have in prosecuting and punishing a criminal. Um, the One of the standard views of punishment or theories of punishment, um, and a the theory of punishment says, gives us an account of what justifies criminal punishment, right? We do this thing as a society. When someone breaks one of our laws uh, and they get caught, if it's a bad enough law, we all agree that it's okay to coerce them, literally take them and put them in a jail cell or take money from them or whatever. In every other context, you can't do that. In every other context, we think that's wrong and also illegal, you know, kidnapping somebody. So why is it that we agree that it's okay to coerce someone and put them in jail when they break laws. What justifies that? The retributive theory of punishment says, look, what justifies it is that criminal wrongdoers have inflicted harm, not just on an individual, although certainly on an individual, but also a sort of grander societal harm. Um, the murderer has, has, has hurt society in some way and in some degree um, so has the thief the retributive theory of punishment says that um, what justifies putting them in prison is that it restores the kind of balance it's a kind of like cosmic healing that has to happen right if you do something wrong uh, something wrong of the same degree must be done to you or if you harm to degree 10 then 10 degrees of harm must come to you in order for the scales of justice to be restored. Um, that's the idea behind the retributivist theory of, of, of punishment. And if that is what justifies punishment, like if that's the correct theory, Paraboom says, yeah, uh, then if no one's responsible for what they do, then, um, then the retributivist theory entails that, uh, that punishment is never justified. Um, because the retributivist theory 
presupposes that the harm that the wrongdoer inflicts on society is uh, a harm for which they are responsible. Um, but if it turns out no one's responsible, then um, then on retributivist grounds alone, we can't justify uh, punishing somebody. Um, this would be a problem, a practical problem, right? Because if it meant that punishment was in general unjustifiable because the retributivist theory has to go out the window if hard and compatibilism is true, if it meant that punishment in general was unjustifiable, then we need to like let everybody out. But that's obviously a terrible idea. I mean, you might have a view on which uh, mass incarceration in the United States is um, is uh, way too large as a system, and that uh, nonviolent crimes are punished as if they were violent crimes. And so you might think the prison population should be much smaller. But no one thinks, virtually no one thinks, that literally tomorrow we should just open the, the doors to every prison everywhere and let every criminal out regardless of criminal wrongdoing. That would be dangerous, right? There are some criminals that, that are a danger to society. And so this is the alleged harm that comes from believing that there's no free will. How does Paraboom respond? He says, yes, the retributivist theory is, is justified, but no, we don't have to swing open all of the doors at the jail cells because there's a different grounds on which to uh, justify punishment. Um, and it's compatible with there being no free will. What grounds? Well, according to him, uh, you don't have to be responsible for your crime or your wrongdoing in order for the state uh, or all of us collectively, if you want to think of it that way, to be justified in coercing you into staying locked in a cell. He says, imagine someone gets a terrible deadly disease that if it were to spread could cause mass death and suffering. Um, has to be, you know, probably imagine it much worse than COVID-19. If it were bad enough and we discovered that there were a few people in New York City who had this um, through no fault of their own, the authorities, he says, would be justified at that point in quarantining them, physically coercing them and restraining them to house arrest, even if they didn't want to. And even though they weren't responsible for getting the disease, why would they be justified? They would be justified uh, because whether or not they're responsible, it is the only measure that is uh, effective at preserving the most life in society, effectively. He thinks just as we're justified in quarantining the people with an infectious deadly disease, likewise we can uh, be justified in quarantining uh, criminals who are not responsible for what they do, but whose crime is a danger, just as the virus is a danger to society. Um, so whether or not they're responsible at the end of the day, according to Paraboom, doesn't matter for the contagion theory of punishment. What matters is, can they cause harm to society? Um, so he wants to relocate the grounds of punishment on a different theoretical basis here. We discussed in class, I think there are a lot of potential problems with this with this theory, uh, this contagion theory. Um, I worry that it has the potential to um, naturalize crime in a certain way and like turn and make us think of it as something, you know, as cr make us think of criminals as kind of like virus carriers, which I think is a dangerous line of thought. It would be interesting to think about how one could implement this both rhetorically and public policy and so on in a way that didn't quite make the connection between uh, contagious deadly disease and criminality so tight. Um, and so we had, I think, some good discussions about that in, in class. But um, that's something to think about. Um, um, I'm going to skip this bit. That is the bad consequences argument. Um, against hard incompatibilism, um, and that is the end of our discussion of incompatibilism. Take care.